Hello, family, friends, the Graceview family. We are appreciative of all of you who have logged on on this evening uh, to participate in our midweek Bible study. And this uh, particular Bible study theme uh, is shift. And uh, as we discuss this great topic, what we're emphasizing is the reality that uh, God is definitely up to something. I think it's uh, quite obvious that God has allowed some challenges to uh, uh, for human beings to experience in this world that have certainly challenged and changed the trajectory of very much of the things that we are connected to. At the same time, this is uh, an era of spiritual awakening for everybody in this world uh, who considers themselves followers of Jesus Christ. And so from a thematic perspective, uh, we are in a shift. We are in a transition. And one of the worst things that you can do while you're in a transition is to not attach yourself to uh, an anchor. I would even declare the anchor, which is God himself, that can help navigate uncharted waters, that can bring stability to your life and even bring more clarity and understanding about what you're going through and why. So that's why we've entitled this Wednesday Bible study series as shift because most of us right now are in a shift. So what we want to do is to continue to provide some uh, some biblical insights uh, to apply some principles to each of our lives that will help us to navigate this this time of transition and shifting uh, in a healthier fashion, perhaps than what you have so far. So thank you for connecting yourselves with us on tonight. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer and uh, let's get into God's word and see what we have on tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to once again feast on your word and to um, try to, to discover things that will help us to be better for you. We pray for every listener, everybody who's watching right now, we pray uh, that as you operate in each of our lives, uh, that you will continue to bless us and guide us with clarity and truth and perspective and all those things that we need to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say together, amen. Again, I'm so grateful to have you with us on tonight. And I want to start out our time tonight by asking you to turn your Bibles over to Deuteronomy and uh, the chapter is two, Deuteronomy chapter two. Um, we're going to be focusing on a group of people uh, who probably knew uh, what it was like to shift perhaps more than any other group in the Bible. And that certainly is the Israelites of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy is a very interesting book. Some have called it the second law. Um, this is a period of time that is uh, very unique in the Exodus experience of the, of the Israelite people. You see, the Israelites are uh, a part of God's special family. The father of that great nation is none other than Abraham. And Abraham was a man who God called in Genesis chapter 12 to be the father of this nation. He will be the, uh, the, the, the focus of something new that God was doing in the world. Abraham was promised that he would be the father of a great nation and that uh, his descendants would number the stars. In other words, it's a, it is a, a word that exaggerates the reality that there will be a great number of people that will be descendants of Abraham. In particular, he gave birth to a son named Isaac, who was birthed to Abraham and his wife, Sarah, after they were very old in age, past the child birthing age. Isaac was a great man who gave birth to Jacob and Esau. If you know the story of Jacob and Esau, you know that Jacob stole the birthright from his brother Esau in a very cunning way. Yet, because he carried the promise, his seed was blessed and he gave birth to 12 sons. Those 12 sons were later known as the 12 tribes of Israel because Jacob wrestled with the angel at a certain point in scripture his name was changed to Israel, and so he will be known as Israel, a man or one who struggles with man and God. And so the Israelites 
are descendants of, of Abraham. And eventually the Bible tells us by the end of Genesis that one of those sons, Joseph, who was mistreated by his brethren, made it to Egypt and was the second in charge of that great nation. His brothers moved, his father moved to Egypt and their descendants continued to live there until we enter the book of Exodus where the new Pharaoh has no recollection of the Israelite people in regards to their story of how they matriculated there. And all he could really see was that their number was so great that if they ever turned on Egypt, they would have an opportunity to override them. So slowly but surely, the Israelites became slaves of the Egyptians. And we're introduced to a character named Moses, who God calls from the Hebrew people and he becomes the leader of the Israelites, reluctantly at first. And he even struggles with his place in uh, their community even years later. But God used him to lead Israel out of Egyptian bondage after over 400 years of slavery. The Bible tells us that they passed through the Red Sea, which was a miraculous event. They passed through the Red Sea after God parted the sea. And they did this on dry land. Now, after they got to the other side, they went through a number of challenges. They faced a number of issues, a lot of it because they did not have the type of faith that God felt was necessary in order for them to inherit his promises. And so the books of uh, Numbers uh, give us detailed accounts about the Israelites as they traveled through the desert, the wilderness. By the time we get to the book of Deuteronomy, it seems as time uh, has ended for Moses as leader. By the end of the book, he has died and the baton is given to Joshua. But before all of this happens, the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness and God gives an indication that perhaps the time for all of this has come to an end. That brings us to Deuteronomy chapter two. And I want you to notice with me in verse one. Here's what uh, the Bible says. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and we skirted Mount Seir and many, for rather many days. Moses said, and the Lord spoke to me saying, get this, you have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward. And, and that's really what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks is the shift that you experience and that all of us experience at a certain point in life where it seems that God is moving us in a different direction. This is not always the most comfortable experience. In fact, this can be an extremely frustrating experience because shifts sometimes or shifts rather always happen without our permission. Have you noticed that God never asks you when it's time for a change? That God never consults you when he's ready to do something different in your life? In fact, one of the most frustrating things about God is that he moves like this without our permission. Isn't that amazing that the great God of heaven doesn't ask you and I for permission to change direction in our lives? The best that we can do is to pray that God would keep us during or throughout our transition, but that we will learn whatever necessary lessons there are to be learned so that as we go through the transition and as we get out of that transition, that we are better afterwards than we were before. So here we are looking at these people. And so tonight I want to perhaps title our study, uh, When is Enough Enough? When is enough enough? Have you ever asked that question before? When, God, are you done turning me? I'm tired of this transition. In fact, you're probably asking that right now about the coronavirus or about the racial tensions that exist or whether it's an economic issue or psychological issue that is present because you have been impacted psychologically by everything that's going on. You, you may be asking yourself and asking God, more importantly, when is enough enough? When will we go through this? And I think the children of Israel were at this point too. They had been traveling in the wilderness for nearly 40 years at this point. And the question was, when is enough enough? 
And God jumps in somewhere here and says, you guys have been skirting around this mountain long enough. It's time for me to turn you in a different direction. So I'm going to pull from this three quick principles that I think are very important for you and I to understand as we think about shifting and think about the things that God might be doing. I want you to turn your Bibles over to uh, Deuteronomy chapter eight, just a few more chapters. Three things I want to pull out of here um, and, and extrapolate these things for us to be able to see and apply to our own lives. Deuteronomy 8, uh, the, the scripture begins in verse 1 uh, by saying, God says, every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. In other words, you hear uh, this language that is saying that if you will do the things that I tell you to do, essentially you're going to prosper where you're going. And the next verse is very, very telling. The next verse tells us, then you should remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. And so here it is that God has given some kind of signal as to why he's allowed what he's allowed and why he's expecting what he's expecting and what he hopes to see when the shift is over. Three things I want to pull from me. Hopefully you're taking notes tonight. Three things that I want to show you that this text uh, is teaching us about how we can manage our way through shifts in our own lives. Number one, I believe that God is teaching us in the middle of a shift. He's teaching us that enough will probably be enough when you learn not to forget. When you learn not to forget. Notice in verse two that the text tells us, and you shall remember. Underline that in the Bible. You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. I think one of the things that God is trying to get each and every one of us to understand and appreciate and value when we go through shifts in our lives is that we should never forget who got us through it in the first place. You know, one of the things that is probably the most frustrating things for us to see in society, especially in our community for those who are of the darker hue, is when we see people who grow up and experience the things we, we have experienced, to have to deal with some of the things that we deal with, to yet persevere through all of those things and then get to a place where you forget where you came from. I know I probably heard you say amen in there now. Where you've met people in life that have gotten so far that they've forgotten where they come from. They've forgotten the people who've made the sacrifices. They've forgotten the people who, who made sure that they had something to eat when they didn't have anything, that you had a few dollars when you didn't have a dime to your name, that there were people who would not let you fail, that they believed in you so much that they pushed you to this place of excellence that you are now experiencing, or at least this place of progress that you're experiencing in your life. One of the things that is the most difficult to see is when people forget where they came from and forget the contributions that others have made in their lives that allow them to be where they are in life. Isn't it interesting that God, the God of heaven, who is the giver of all good blessings, is saying, I want you to make sure that now that you're transitioning and, and things seem to be getting a little better, don't forget who got you to this place in the first place. I think that's really, really important for all of us to understand because the danger of forgetting who got us through this is perhaps you'll have to go through some more issues in the future so that you won't forget who got you through these things in the first place. Also, one of the dangers of forgetting who got you through is a lack of trust when you face challenges in your future. You've probably experienced that. I know I have in my life where I've gotten through something and and then something else happened and and I quickly forgot of the, the faithful God who had 
who had gotten me through challenges before. And I knew that I had forgotten because I began to develop a sense of fear that I know that God didn't give me and a sense of anxiety. And, and, and I struggled with things in my mind more than I should have only because I forgot that the same God who helped me when I couldn't pay my bills, the same God that helped me through health crises, the same God that got me through certain types of drama in my life is the same God who can get me through the very wall that's in front of me. So God is saying, when you're going through transition, it's really important. Don't forget who he is. Don't forget what he's done and, and don't forget how he's done it. You probably even prayed the prayer, God, if you get me through this, I'll never do this again, only to do it again. This is the same God who loves us and cares for us and who gets us through our battles. And so number one, enough might be enough when you learn not to forget. But enough might not be enough or might be enough rather. Number two, when you learn to be humble. Check out the text. The text again, verse two says, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Watch this. To humble you. To humble you. You know, one of the things I think Proverbs, um, I think it's in chapter seven, it talks about the things that God hates. And he talks about a, a, a haughty or a, a arrogant heart type of person that is, as we would say, too big headed. They're the type of person who is so arrogant and thinks so much of themselves that there's no room for there to be a God to operate in their lives. In fact, uh, they're the person that is so self-consumed, they've become their own little God. God is saying that one of the things that he wants us to do in transition is he wants us to be the kind of people who will be humble. James is, James is a very interesting uh, book of the Bible. It, it is very, very uh, direct in giving us certain principles that help us to be mature in life. He says something interesting that I thought was a good parallel uh, for this particular study. You see, God says that he allowed these things to happen to Israel to humble them. James tells us in James chapter four, verses 10, James says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You see the difference? In Deuteronomy, God tells Israel, you guys got so arrogant that I had to humble you. James says, make sure you humble yourself. See, for the person who lifts themselves up, God has to humble them and bring them down. For the person who already has a sense of modesty and, and uh, a person who is, uh, has a reverential ex respect for God and, and his power and who doesn't mind humbling themselves, the Bible says that that person God will lift up. I think the principle is very simple. It's much better and less harmful if you learn to humble yourself. You know, every now and then, whenever I feel that uh, my heart has perhaps become uh, a, a bit too haughty, there's a sermon that I watch uh, by Pastor E. Dewey Smith. He preaches this sermon. You could probably look it up on YouTube uh, called, um, uh, 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 called Just a Carpenter. There it is. And one of the things that he discusses in that sermon is the the nature that many uh, of God's people have to want all of the possessions of a king. Jesus was a king and certainly he is the king. But we often forget that before he was recognized as a king on the earth, that he was a carpenter. Carpenters were uh, people who were not considered to be rich people in society. They were often very poor and societally uh, insignificant. And Jesus was in this position in his life more than he was the three years where he was seen as the great healer and the king and the Messiah. And one of the things that he asserts in that lesson is that so many of us want to be kings, but we don't want to accept the responsibility of being carpenters. James and the Moses and Moses here, they write to us the reality of what happens if you don't appreciate the, the life of being a carpenter, that you don't have to be significant to everybody, that you don't have to be the king of every hill, that, 
that we ought to learn how to appreciate whatever God allows us to have access to. Paul says that, you know, at one point he struggled with arrogance and having a haughty heart and, and that uh, God, because he didn't want him to be too arrogant, he gave him a thorn in his flesh to remind him of the humility that he needed. In fact, Paul even told us uh, in 1 Corinthians that the way that he learned uh, how to be humble uh, and content in all things is, is that he knew what it was like to have a lot and he knew what it was like to have very little. Paul says, and I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. He says that because he recognizes that at some point in life, you'll never really have enough. We look to celebrity and we say, wow, it'd be nice to have so much money. And yet we see people with so much money and wealth seeming to have some of the biggest problems than anybody else in society. I think what God is trying to help us to understand right now in this shift that we're going through is that we have to value humility. We have to make sure that it is a virtue in our lives, that it's important to know that it's okay to not be the king of every hill, that as long as God affirms you, then you don't need to be affirmed by anybody else. Learn in this transition how to be humble. The last thing I believe that God is teaching us is that enough might be enough when you learn obedience. Consider this, that Israel struggled perhaps most with obedience. They struggled with doing simply what God told them to do. And you might say to yourself, well, how is it that a people who have been shackled up for over 400 years in Egyptian bondage, how is it that they don't understand obedience? Church and friends, Whenever we begin to amass things that we value, whenever we begin to get our way, the devil likes to take up residence in our heart and cause us to also shift in our understanding of appreciativeness to the extent that we don't value obedience as much as we should. And our disobedience is a sign of a lack of appreciation for what God has done. Israel was brought through the Red Sea on dry land. God had done something great. They were guided by night with a pillar of fire and by day with a pillar of a cloud, and yet they failed to be obedient. That they complained and whined to God, where are we going to eat and, and what will we drink? And, and even though they doubted God, God blessed them with water from a desert rock and, and he blessed them with manna, on the ground every day and quail to eat every day. And, and, and yet they struggled with obedience. And then one of the things I'm trying to help you understand is that one of the things that God does in transition is he teaches us obedience. Consider what he says again in verse two, you should remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. One of the reasons why God allows us to go through transitions and shifts in life is to help us to understand the kind of stuff that's in our own heart. One of the things I recognize is that uh, when I'm in transition, one of the things that I don't like the most is not knowing what's gonna happen next. And each of us has our own little vice. We have our own little thing that we struggle with, especially in transition. And one of the things that God has to teach me when I'm going through transition is to block and blind me a lot of times from the things that I'm getting ready to experience enough so that I will be more obedient and trustful into what God is trying to do. I often find that when I'm able to predict what God is doing next, when I'm able to kind of see a pattern, is when I struggle most in my daily obedience to God. So what God was doing is he was allowing them to go through the wilderness and experience all those trials and tribulations in order to test them so that they may know the kind of things that were in, your heart, in their hearts. Likewise, we are able to see the kind of stuff in our hearts when we go through the greatest difficulties. I believe that the greatest difficulties in life, in life are often the greatest teachers of the kind of stuff that's going on in your heart. Beautiful thing about it is that you're able to see it, identify it, and to make a change. Those of us who struggle most are those of us who ignore those things that we can clearly see in our hearts or even um, 
resist and reject the opportunity to even evaluate what's going on in our hearts. So when we use transition to look in our hearts to see what's there, to try to see what are, um, you know, the, the things that we uh, have the tendency to do and fail at, then we're able to make adjustments and be more obedient to God. And the Bible teaches us that when we learn to be more obedient, that God shifts us from a time of testing to a time of blessing. Once again, recognize that God said, you guys have skirted around this mountain long enough. He says, now it's time to turn toward the north, toward the promised land. And for many of us, God is looking to see, will you have a memory and a remembrance of who God is and what he's done? Will you have a humble heart? And, and will you be obedient? Because sometimes until we learn to accomplish those things, we are not in position for God to say, you've skirted around long enough. It's time to take you to the next level. Some of us right now are not at our next level because we have not developed a, a heart of appreciation and humility and obedience to be able to collect all that God has for us. What I want tonight uh, in this lesson to emphasize is that instead of asking the question, when is enough enough? Perhaps it's a time for evaluation to say, how am I remembering the God who has saved me and helped me? Have I humbled myself? And have I been obedient to God's word and his will? I, I believe if you take the time to evaluate those things, you'll find more answers and you'll find God beginning and beginning to open up the passageway to a life of productivity. Friends, I hope this lesson blessed you on tonight. Can't wait to connect with you again as we study more on the subject of shift. May God bless you and we'll see you next time. Peace.